Welcome to the Project Endure podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Before we get started, let me just say that we get it. Personal development can be hard, but you don't have to do it alone. Project Endure has been on a mission to create a supportive and inspiring community of people, all striving to be better together. Head down to the link in the show notes and join the Hard Things Club so that we can do hard things together. And if you're already a member, invite a friend and spread the love. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to the Project Endure podcast, episode 173. We have myself, and in the great city of Philadelphia, we have a very, very special guest, Aunt D'Andrea. Aunt, how are you? I'm doing great, my man. How about yourself? I am amazing. Now, we're going to get right to it because you have a picture behind you. Uh, people listening can't see, but the picture is Rocky with his fist in the air at the top of the Rocky steps here in Philly. And uh, there's words on, on the picture. I can't read them. Do you know more or less what those words say? Absolutely. Absolutely. It doesn't matter how hard you can get uh, or how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward, baby. Uh, I love it. And uh, that sets the tone for a lot of what we're going to talk about in this conversation. But before we go there, why don't we start with this? For people listening to this episode who have no idea who you are, how would you introduce yourself? Oh, man, that's a great question. Well, my, my name is Aunt Andrea. Uh, just like you were saying, Joe, grew up in Northeast Philly my entire yeah. life. Um, what I do now is uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a uh, personal trainer and a nutrition coach. Uh, I operate a community called Grit and Gratitude, and we have about 185 members in our free Facebook community, and we do a lot of you know one-on-one coaching um, and everything along those lines. I train in person at gyms, um, Lifetime up in Fort Washington, and then a, a small gym called Spark and Vitality. So my whole life involves around fitness, health and fitness, uh, and then I do... Do some running on the side as well. I got, I got a couple of ultra marathons under my belt that my older brother convinced me to start doing a couple of years ago. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much pretty much what I'm about. Just running, lifting, taking care of myself and just, you know, itching to be better and help other people be better as well. Yeah. So there's a lot to unpack. And I guess we'll go back to a little bit of running that you do, which uh, is not so little. Uh, the the, the reason we know each other is an event that happened uh, last month here in Philadelphia, and it was 24 hours up and down the art museum steps. And you just had this pep in your step. Every time I saw you, you were just popping up and down those steps, smile on your face. I think I got the most compliments from you. Every time we passed each other, you told me I was looking great, even when I wasn't, uh, which I appreciated. And, uh, and yeah, and we got talking a little bit, but I have to be honest. Uh, I can't remember who it was, but someone passed me on the steps at one point, I want to say middle of the night. And they said, you have to have Ant on the podcast. His story is crazy. Right. And, uh, you know, we talked a bit about it and I got, uh, the cliff notes version of your life story. We'll, we'll break that down on this episode. So before we get to any of that, let me ask you this, your mm -hmm. last name, is that Italian? Yes, sir. I love it. So you come from Italian roots. Do you, uh, how do I say this? Do you feel like your Italian heritage is a big part of who you are? Is that something that informs how you live your life or is it just something that's a part of you? It's a great question, man. Um, it's like something that's a part of me. Um, so I'm Puerto Rican and Italian. I'm mostly Puerto Rican. Um, and so a lot of like, a lot more into like the Hispanic culture, the Puerto Rican culture. Um, but we do have like Italian roots and uh, my fiance, Grace, uh, was able to do like this ancestry thing. So I know exactly where from Italy I'm from. So like I I'm planning to go there and check it out and see if I have any family there and things along those lines. So it's something I want to get more in touch to in touch with. Um, but I'm also a big nerd when it comes to like Greek and Roman mythology. So I love learning about like ancient Rome and all that stuff. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So this is on a lighter note, a great chance for me to ask this question, but on social media earlier this year, there was this thing going around. These videos kept popping up and it was guys 
being asked by their significant others, their, their, their girlfriends or spouses, whoever, you know, when's the last time you thought about the Roman empire? Um, mm-hmm. and, and I, I was shocked at how recent all of these people would say, Oh, yesterday or oh, last week, I have not thought about the Roman empire outside of history class in high school, maybe, maybe about once. What is it about, you know, Greek and Roman, uh, history, mythology, et cetera, that, uh, excites you and makes you so curious. So when I was, when I was younger, um, I was a big reader and like in school, I would get in trouble for reading and I picked up, you know, the Percy Jackson series and I fell in love with it on the Greek side. And then I realized that the author had like a whole bunch of Egyptian mythology and Roman mythology books. And, uh, I just dove into those and just read all about it and started learning about it and loved it. Um, (laughs) <laughs> to keep it transparent, man, to keep it real, a therapist told me that it was me like disassociating from my childhood and like putting myself in that world to kind of like manage what I was going through. So that's always like an interesting thing to think about. But like it resonates with me, man. And I have like uh, Greek and Roman mythology, like leg sleeve. And so it's something that I want to continue to work on and finish. But yeah, it's just something I'm super interested in for sure. Yeah. So we'll get into the big deep stuff here in a second. But when's the last time you thought about the Roman Empire before this podcast? Honestly, it was earlier today because I was talking to a client who I asked him what audio book he's reading and he mentioned Percy Jackson. So we started going back and forth about like Greek mythology and the Roman Empire and stuff. So earlier today. Yeah, that's hilarious. Um, So, all right. So you alluded to your childhood and I'll ask this question and then you can take it wherever you want, even if it's not childhood. But when you look back at your life to this point, What's the hardest thing that you've ever had to handle that you did not choose for yourself? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I heard I heard on a couple of other shows you ask, and it's such a great question, man. Um, because a lot of the stuff that I do now is on purpose, and which is like we'll get into. But I mean, you know, when I was I was 10 years old and um, you know, just like living your typical Northeast Philly life, like like, you know, my parents, I had an older brother, I had a half brother. Um, and when I was 10 years old, it ended up that my dad murdered my mom and then committed suicide when I was outside playing with my friends. So like I came home and was locked out of the house. Like I went and got neighbors, like the cops came and everything like that. And my whole, my whole world shifted. And it's interesting to me that when I reflect back, it's not like that one thing that was the most difficult, but it was just like all the things that came with it afterwards. Like Two years later, my guardians got divorced. And when I look back on it now, it's like, well, they had to take in two kids. They're two nephews. Like, you know, the the couple was in their late 20s and I'm 10 and my older brother's 13. So like, that's a really difficult thing to just get thrusted into. Um, but like, I started working at 12. I started doing some not cool stuff, like stealing and fighting and drinking at 12 years old. Like it was, I wasn't on a good path. I wasn't on a good path. And um, started paying for all my stuff when I was younger, like my car insurance, phone bill, groceries, like that all started at 16. So I was just trying to figure it out. And so I think it's just like all of that stuff in one, like, it's not like I can pinpoint, like, this was really challenging, but just trying to navigate without that role. And granted, there was a lot of great things in my life, great people, great influences, great friends. Like I've been with my fiance since I was 14 years old. Like her family is like my family. Like it's, it's cool just like growing together and just like being able to have somebody like that. So there was still good in the story, but it was definitely a hurdle and something I had to, had to learn to manage, you know? Yeah. I coming into this episode knew that you lost both parents. I didn't know how you lost both parents. And um, I'm so sorry that you had to go through that and um, nobody should. Um now that this next question I'm going to ask, I know could be a tough one, maybe not even from an emotional place. I'm sure it could be, but maybe from a memory place, because I would imagine that there's a lot you don't want to remember, but what did you feel when you were 10 and, and that happened? I mean, what is a 10 year old experience in a situation like that? I actually didn't really understand at first. So like <laughs> my grandma or my uncle told me that my parents were deceased I'm 10 years old. I'm like, oh, they're diseased. Like they're sick. So I'm like, what do you mean? Like, can we, like, where's the cure? But my bro, my older brother started crying and that's, I was like, all right, well, if he's crying, that's bad. Like, mm-hmm. that's not, cool. um, so it was really like, 
I struggle to comprehend it, but like in the following days when you wake up and they're just not there and like I'm living in New Jersey, like it's, it starts to become more real, but I still never really, I don't think like fully understood it. Um, but it was tough, man. It was like, just like I was out of school for a little bit cause it happened in September. So like actually PHL 24, like it was ironic that I had my, that they passed away on September 12th. Hmm. And September 14th, I did 100K up in Jim Thorpe, which is where I used to vacation with my family. And then we did PHL 24 like a week later. So it was just cool to have those events lined up that way. But um, there was a lot of support, you know, trying to bring family together and going through it together. But it was something that I didn't really understand. And when I did think about it, like I was upset, like it hurt. And even just like throughout school, like when it's like a father son dance or something, or like, or like a father son baseball game is what they would, we would be going to, or like I had to go with my counselor in high school to go to like the father son thing. So like, it was just, I just always felt different. And I guess that was a struggle. Um, my, my counselor's name is Marty Jackson. I'll always bring him up. He's like, he helped me get into LaSalle College High School. Like he helped keep keep me in line and just poured so much into us. Um, but he even operated um, like a group that we would meet on Tuesdays where the students would come and whoever lost a parent, like they would be able to come and connect with one another and have like coffee and stuff like that. Um, but even then it was like everybody lost a parent and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I lost both. You know, it just always felt it was like, it, 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 it was always a. Uh, just a little awkward or like I felt a little left out a little um, on the outside. But at the same time, I wouldn't change anything because I started to learn how to manage that through, like you say, doing hard things. Like that's really what it was that helped me get out of it. So I'm grateful for it all. I'm grateful for the whole, just like it led me to talking to you right now, you know, so I can't, I can't complain or want to change anything. I don't think that a lot of people would believe you when you say that, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's my gut. And I, I say that because I feel the same way about losing my sight. You know, um, when I tell people that I'm on a path toward blindness and I can't change that, but I wouldn't change it because it's made me who I am. It's led me where I am. I think a lot of people are shocked by that because they just, they just don't get it. They haven't lived through that experience. And, um, with that being said, grit and gratitude, right? That's, that's, that's such a powerful combination and I want to hear more about it, but before we get there, it sounds like there was a rough patch, uh, before you got to the grit and gratitude part, Absolutely. how did, how did you get out of that place where you were doing things that maybe you shouldn't have been doing or going, uh, down a path you didn't want to be going down? How did you get out of that? So I, I think it's so important to like, have mentors and be surrounded by people that just want to be better because it got to a point where my older brother, Joey was just, man, I'm like, I'm sitting there as a teenager. I'm like playing video games with my friends and he's like turning the TV off and throwing a book at me and like telling me to read and stuff. And I'm like, Oh no, leave me alone. Like whatever. It got to a point where he was like, and if you read this book, it was rich dad, poor dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And he was like, if you read this book and write a book report, I'm going to give you 50 bucks. And I'm a freshman in college. So I'm like 50 bucks. I'm like, all right, dude, I got you. I read the book. I wrote the book report. And then I didn't take the money because I was like, I get it. Like, I understand where you're coming from. Like mm -hmm. I learned a lot about finances that I never knew before in this book. And from there, I just started reading more. And then he like sent me over in March of 2019. He sent me over Andy Frisella's 75 hard program right when it dropped and I listened to it and I'm like, no drinking two workouts. Like, no, no way. And I'm like, dude, I just like put it on the back burner, but something was like itching at my ear. And I started going back into his podcast. I'm like, all right, well, like that was pretty extreme, but like, let me see what this guy's about. And I would be in the gym listening to the podcast. I would be, you know, walking this class, listening to the podcast. And then in June of 2019, I was like, I'm committing to it. And dude, full transparency, like I failed twice. And I did it for like a hundred, like technically the program took me like 150 days because I failed on day 67 and I failed on day nine. And then I immediately restarted the next day. But after I got through that program, dude, it was like no looking back. It was wow. like, just what else can I do? Like through, re through his program, reading books, like I came across a Masogi from Jesse Itzler, who's 
do one major event a year. And I'm like, all right, I'm gonna run a marathon. And then it turned into a 50 miler. And then, and then, and then it just kept rocking and rolling, man. Mm -hmm. So I really attribute the change in mentality just to my brother's influence, like pushing me to start reading. And then it just kind of grew from there. Mm -hmm. So I, I love to ask this kind of question because when you look at life, I think there are two kinds of hard. There's the hard that you choose and the hard that chooses you. And in theory, both kinds of hard could make you a better person. They could help you grow, right? Um, or they could beat you down and keep you there. Um, they can they can really uh, work in the opposite direction as well, right? So what is it about people that lets someone grow through hard things? Like, what is it about you internally? Not and and I do agree, right? It's about the people who lift us up and surrounding ourselves with positive things. But what is it inside of you, if you had to say, that allowed you to grow through all of this rather than just play victim and uh, roll over? There was a, th through listening to Andy Frisella's podcast, he said something that really impacted me one day. And he said, nobody gives a fuck what you've been through if you don't get over it if you don't get through it, if you don't become better on the other side of it. And I sat there and I was like, that's damn right. I could sit here and just use everything in my life as an excuse. And the thing is, is that everybody would let me, they would be okay with it. They'd be like, all right, that's a valid excuse. But to me, I then changed that into, I went through what I did for a reason and I need to find out what that reason is. And I realized that like through 75 hard, I'm like, all right, I'm controlling the things I can, no alcohol, I'm 19 years old. I'm not drinking alcohol. I'm sticking to a clean diet. I'm working out twice a day, once outside. I'm reading personal development books, drinking a gallon of water, taking a progress photo. And I did that for so long. And on the other end of it, I'm like, my life is so much better. And in that process, like I dropped out of college at 19. Like I was, I tried to become a sports writer and it didn't happen. I tried to become a salesman in real estate, didn't work out. I went for a couple jobs, like got denied. I want to be a public adjuster and my fiance got me the book so I could study. And then I quit on it a week later. And then that's when I got into like health and fitness and stuff. But during this time, I'm trying all these different things and failing. And I realize on the other side of it, I'm like, I've never been happier. I know what I know a whole bunch of things of what I don't want to do. And I know I'm getting closer to what I do want to do. Mm. And then, you know, I went into nursing school out of high school because I loved anatomy and physiology. And I was like, well, if I'm passionate about that, I might as well do that and just like went for it. But through doing 75 hard, that led me to pushing myself. And in September of 2020, I was training for a marathon. I couldn't even run a mile. January of 2020, I couldn't even hit a mile. Came into my house and to my fiance, Grace, I'm like, running's fucking stupid. Like, I don't know who would do that. Like, that's silly. I couldn't even hit a mile. And, um, I got up to like nine miles and then that's when my brother convinced me to go to 50. And so in September of 2020, I ran 50 miles on the exact anniversary of my parents' death. And it was during COVID. So I did it in my neighborhood at my house. I did five mile loops 10 times um, and I got it done. And from that next day, I was like, that was really hard. And I've never been ha happier, more proud of that accomplishment. And each time it just boosts that confidence, man. So I, I realized that when I do hard things, I get more confident, I get a better skill set, and it better enables me to handle hard things in other areas. So like I go do an ultra and I uh, hit a hundred miles or I go do 63 on the steps while you're tearing it up and hitting like in the mid seventies. Um, when I do those hard things, it helps me better manage my stress in my business. Or if my fiance and I are arguing, I can like step back and control my emotions better because I do those things. Mm. So I don't think I'll ever stop doing hard things because I realize that I am better at the end of it. Like the bigger the test, the bigger the reward at the end of at the end of the day, like when I get through it, because I know it's just left foot, right foot. Like just keep taking the time's gonna pass inevitably. You said something on your uh Instagram a couple of days ago that really inspired me. And it was like for people that are struggling to get up at the first alarm, you're going to be tired at the end of the day anyway. So are you going to be proud of yourself or are you going to be pissed off at yourself? And that's that's the exact mentality when it's doing the hard things, dude, seriously.
Yeah, man. Well, well, first of all, I couldn't agree more with every single word that you said. And, um, you know, just to maybe put it in different language in case that didn't resonate with someone. I just think that we all have this internal resistance to discomfort, right? And um, when you choose to do hard things, you're almost training yourself to make the decision to push through or into the discomfort a little bit more quickly, right? And the more you do that, that space gets smaller. And so you build up this reflex, you build up this habit, you build up this muscle of, yeah, I don't want to do this, or it's uncomfortable, or it's inconvenient, or whatever, 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 I'm going to do it anyway. And it's building that scale of do it anyway. And I think, like you said, it carries over, right? And it's, it might not be perfect. And I think we all have those things that are harder than others. But, you know, if you can go out and you can, you know, run these big races or train when you don't want to, or get up when you're tired, then you're probably more likely to be able to show up for that person you care about when it's inconvenient or do that other thing when you don't want to, but you know, it's good for you. And I just couldn't, I can't emphasize that enough because I don't think life is very complicated. I think we make it complicated at times, but I think at the end of the day, it's pretty simple. There are no shortcuts, hard work works, and you just have to be consistent. And um, I know you know that. And I hope that through listening to conversations like this, other people can believe it enough to try it for themselves. But with that being said, I'd love to hone in on the words grit and gratitude. And so to you, right, what does grit mean? We'll start there. Um, <clears throat> that's a great question, man. So grit to me is just persevering through hard things. It's waking up and knowing like my mentality is I want to do something hard as soon, the earliest that I can, as soon as I wake up, Jocko Willing says his first enemy or his first battle is that alarm when it goes off. And that's, that's one thing that I view it. Um, but what I realize is that the more, I guess like grit is embracing hard things. And we just went into depth about how doing hard things can make you a better human overall. And so that's what it's about for me. Um, the gratitude part, it's funny because my fiance and I run the company together. And so people say like, I'm, I'm the grit. She's the gratitude <laughs> it works. It works out well. Um, but I also do a gratitude exercise every day, man. I do like whenever I brush my teeth, I brush my teeth when I wake up and before I go to bed, I'm just listing the things off that I'm grateful for. And it can be something as simple as a roof over my head or the shirt that's on my back or the ability to breathe and be healthy. Like, it's so cool because the more you think about it, when you think about something more, that's what you get. You get more of that. And so I like to say that if you do something hard and you put yourself in a state of gratitude every day, you can't have a bad day. Like mm -hmm. you, you are setting yourself up to crush the day. Yeah. So Anytime I think of gratitude, I think of a good friend and client, Julie Burrill. She was episode 138 on this podcast. I want to say that she's been gratitude journaling for, at this point, well over a thousand days. Maybe she's approaching 2000. Um, and it is such a powerful force. And, you know, this will go deep and hopefully it makes sense. Hopefully it's not too abstract. But a lot of times I think, right, all these things that I tell myself, you know, I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when I have that thing or I make this much money or, you know, this circumstance comes true, right? I'll be happy when the truth is, I'm sure if I fast forward to when I'm 60 years old and maybe I have all these things, I would give them all up to be 30 again. And, um, you know, this moment is the youngest that all of us will ever be. And if you're healthy enough to be awake and alive and listening to this podcast, there's so much to be grateful for. And I think when you look at life through that lens, right, you can't have a bad day because you get to be here. And um, it's easier said than done. But let me ask you this. Are there certain days where gratitude is just really, really, really hard to come by? Or have you built up that muscle enough where even on the tough days, it's, it's such a reflex at this point that you can come up with some things? I love that you called it a reflex, dude, because I just say like a production pivot. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, as soon as I find myself getting into a rut or just like getting pounded on throughout the day like right there that's a signal for me that i know i need to do something and for me like i have learned and i've been aware of and like i know myself to the point where like i know the things that can get my mind right and i know you said your friend and client julie does the gratitude journal like that's one thing that i'll go to just to like empty out the things that i'm grateful for 
going on a run. I live right next to Penny Pack Park. And like, I love going out in Penny Pack and going on a run. It's a quarter of a mile away from my house, like listening to good music. Like there's a couple things that can help rewire my brain when I find myself going off course, because that's the thing. Like, I feel like a lot of people and something that I encounter with clients is like they, their expectation is perfection, where it's really just progress. Like, all right, you fall off. How can you get back on quicker the next time? And that's really what I've been focusing on. And now it's happened. I fall off less and less. And when I do fall off, it's for a shorter time because I have those things in my back pocket that I know that will rewire my brain and get me back on track. But when I do fall off, like it's a pretty, pretty strong muscle at this point that I can re like refocus, put myself in that state of gratitude because that's what it always is. I reached out to a client and I've been asking all my clients this week, like, what's happiness to you? And the one guy blew me away. His name's Mike Clifford. He's a pilot. He's one of the most interesting men I know. And he was just like, happiness is in the now, man. He's like, I do my hobbies. I need to live with my girlfriend. He's like, I fly the plane. I take care of myself. And like, happiness is in the now. And I was like, that's the best answer that I've gotten. And that blew my socks off. So it's just happy. Like you said, like, you're never going to be this young. Uh, that little uh, chat GPT thing that's going around. It's like when you're 80 years old, you're going to wish you had the legs that you did now and you're going to reflect back and like, are you proud of it? Are you not proud of it? And dude, that's what it's about at the end of the day. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I used that audio to make a piece of content this morning because it, it really resonated with me because, you know, yeah, someday when walking is a struggle for all of us, if you're listening to this and you're a runner, even your worst day running, you would, I'm sure, give anything to have back and just do one more time. And, uh, you know, on the happiness piece, I think a lot of people chase happiness as if it's something that you can grab onto. And I don't know the, the, the truth, right? Or if there is a truth about happiness that's universal, but I think happiness is something that comes as a byproduct of living in alignment and living in this present moment, like your, your client had said, um, or being fulfilled, right? Like doing hard things, doing good things, being there for other people. I think happiness comes along with those things. And there's this quote from uh, Osho. I don't know who Osho is, but that's who said this apparently. Uh, and it goes, if you love a flower, don't pick it up. Because if you pick it up, it dies and it ceases to be what you love. So if you love a flower, let it be. Love is not about possession. Love is about appreciation. And I think, you know, if we can learn to appreciate things as they are, not need to control or hold on to them so tightly, I think we would find a lot more happiness because when you start to let go, when you start to surrender, which is a hard thing within itself, I think life starts to flow a little bit easier and things become a little bit more beautiful. Uh, and that's something that I'm working on and uh, will continue to work on for my entire life. I'm sure. Absolutely. That is, I love that. I love that because I mean, it really is true. I have a, <laughs> a sign that hangs up. It's like a little Buddha and it says, let that shit go underneath. And that's really, that's really what it is, man. I mean, Full transparency, a year ago, I wrote on my parents' anniversary, I, wrote, like I, I penned a letter on Instagram. Um, and one thing that I shared in regard to my dad, like, I forgive you. Because I forgive you, not for you, for me. I heard Tony Robbins say that if you blame somebody for the bad, you have to blame them for the good as well. And there's no fucking shot. I'm letting that man take any credit for the good that I'm doing. And if I continue to hold on to that, it would slow me down and it would be like dragging a ton of bricks as I'm trying to move forward and, and, and impact people. And so I had to let that go because that makes room for, like you said, the love and appreciation of who I am now and where I'm going forward. And I'm not carrying it around anymore, man. Like I can talk about it. I, I let it, like I was dealt that hand. I feel like I played it as best as I could. And I'm appreciative of that. And just like you said, man, it's not a possession type of thing. It's just being, I mean, in in a state of gratitude of who you are, of, where, of what you're doing. And, you know, when you think too far ahead, even in an ultra, man, that was one thing that I learned. Like if I think too far ahead, I get overwhelmed. Mm. If I think about all the stuff I did, I start to be like, oh my God, and I still got to go forward. Like I just got to be in right here, right now and just appreciate every step. And that's yeah. really what it is. 
Yeah. And just put it in the words of a previous podcast guest and a great friend, Kieran Williams, uh, he, the title of his, his episode, episode 20, it is what it is. And Kieran's a very laid back, uh, very cool, calm, collected kind of guy. Nothing seems to bother him, but you know, it is what it is, right? We can't change what happened in the past. We have to learn to let go and let be. And, you know, I once heard this phrase, I don't know who said it, but to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to realize that the prisoner is you. And uh, again, when I, I think when we hold on to things, right, like we might not even realize it, but by holding on tightly to certain things, those things can also hold on to us. And um, I just think it's beautiful. Uh, everything that you said and everything that you do is really inspiring. And uh, I appreciate our conversation and we're, we're not even done yet. Um, so with that being said, and you've done a lot of hard things as well, and you've done a lot of hard things on purpose. When you think back to all the hard things that you've done, all the challenges you've taken on, what's the hardest thing that you've ever done on purpose and why? Oh, that's great, man. So I got to say uh, the New Jersey Devil 100 um, put on by Beast Coast. Such a great, uh, such a great like race, um, just like all the races. The one I did this past week and the Hainesport 100 is put on by them. And uh, this was a one and done race. They haven't done it again since. They're trying to get the permits. Be like, man, when I tell you it rained throughout the night, I was hallucinating. I got trench foot. So my feet went numb. It was a disease from like World War One, where like it's a step above hypothermia, but the the trails were so the banks on the trails were so high that it filled with water. So we were like trudging through water for the majority of the race. Um, there's a video on an Instagram. I'll find it and I'll send it over to you. But it's me talking shit at mile 20. Like, oh, yeah, the, the, the real race starts at mile 80. And then it cuts to mile 80. And I'm like bawling my eyes out as my pacer, my buddy <laughs> Anthony, throws me into the van and my fiance is tending to me. My brother's laughing at me like, man, that thing broke me spiritually, physically, mentally. Like the picture they got of me after with the belt buckle took me 28 hours. My face was red. I was just crying. Like it was the hardest thing I've ever done. And I was willing to go through it. Like I, I wanted to do it. And it, for me, it was like, if, if I had a superpower, my, my superpower suffering. So mm -hmm. like when I go back and I'm like, I, I can, I look back throughout my childhood and I'm like, I did a lot of suffering and I know I can take it. So I know I can take this shit. Like I trusted my pacer, my buddy, Aunt Rusamano, again, he ran 49 miles with me through the woods because the original plan was for him to let me loose on the last 11, but I was so broken and so beat up that he was like, all right, I'm going to stick with you and hit a PR. And all I did was trust him and just do left foot, right foot. And it was literally insane. My brother tells me to this day that he was sleeping in the car and the rain, it was raining so hard. He woke up and literally just thought, I'm glad I'm not out there right now. And he's done two 200 mile races. Like he's done you know, a hundred, like hundreds, like a way better runner than I am, but it was by far the hardest thing I've ever done. And as ever, every time I think back on it, I always had the biggest smile on my face mm -hmm. because it's just, it's like, like cookie in the cookie jar, man. When I'm going through hard shit, I'm like, I, that's a big win, man. I did something like out of everybody that towed the line, less than 50 people finished or 50% of the people finished. Mm -hmm. Like, I was one of those people and I pushed it through the end and no, but like you can't inherit that. Mm. You have to earn that. And I think that's why it's just such a fond memory for me. Like it was so hard, but I earned that. I earned that victory. I have the bell buckle right here, right above my head. Mm. And it's just a reminder that like, there's the hard things that I've done. That's so beautiful. And uh, it reminds me of a quote that I've shared a few times on the podcast the most recent time I shared it was the bonus episode that I did with Jess Leventree, who was on the stairs with us after her 100 mile race. So I'll read it and then we'll talk about it. But it says, every athlete who has pushed beyond his or her known limits of endurance in the quest for improvement understands these sentiments. There is no experience quite like that of driving yourself to the point of wanting to give up and then not giving up. In that moment of raw reality, when something inside of you asks, how bad do you want it? An inner curtain is drawn open, revealing a part of you that is not seen except in moments of crisis. 
And when your answer is to keep pushing, you come away from that trial with the kind of self-knowledge and self-respect that can't be bought. Mm. Right. And like, like you said, you can't inherit that, right? Mm. Like the only way to get that level of self-respect and self-understanding is to go through those, those moments of crisis, that suffering, those points where you, every ounce of you wants to quit. And there's that one little part that says, keep going. And you listen to that part that says, keep going. The next time that part is a little bit bigger and a little bit louder. And that's what, that's what doing hard things is all about. Like, how do you listen to that voice so that it gets louder? Because I think a lot of times it's a whisper for most people. Mm -hmm. Man, that was so well said. Um, I always view it. Um, I think this was Andy Purcell's thing, but like the bitch voice and the boss voice. And I was like, I'm going to feed the boss voice as much as I can. It's like that kind of like the devil and the angel on your, on your shoulder. And just like you said, you have to listen to that voice. And the more you listen to it, the louder it gets as well. Um, yeah, that's, that's really well said. One thing, um, I did a run to Wildwood from the art museum in Philly. My brother, my buddy, Aunt Rusimano, um, our buddy, Luke Spates, we all ran to Ocean City, New Jersey, and then down the coast of Wildwood. And man, that's a huge learning lesson about chafing during a race, because at mile 20, I started getting chafed and I uh. didn't I was on top of it. And so the joke was throughout the end of the race, like mile 80 on, my brother would be screaming at me, you can't buy effort. And that's my mantra through every, every event, man, you can't buy effort. And that's something like similar to what you, what that quote was saying, like, it's something that you can't buy. And that's when I'm down and out, it's like, you can't buy effort. Like, that's it. Like, it's not something that's inherited is not something that bought. Like it's something that is tested and you have to work through that test in order to obtain it. And that's what it like. That's what it is. Every, I just did 101 loops around a one mile course. And my fiance had, you can't buy effort written on a whiteboard for the entire race because it's the damn truth man wow i have two tattoos i would love someday to have an entire sleeve i say that now who knows but i think that's what i want mm -hmm. those words are going to have to be on that sleeve and every time i see it i'm going to think of this conversation because that is too good i love, I love that mm -hmm. i love it i love it the the other thing i'll say is right there are people listening to this who do crazy things, right? They run races, they do ultras, they push themselves. There are also people listening to this. And I hope there's someone new listening to this conversation thinking at this moment, like, man, these guys are crazy. I could never do that. This is unrelatable, but it is, it is so relatable because every single day we all have these choices to make. Right. And it might not look like, do I keep pushing on a hundred mile run? It might look like, you know, I don't want to get up because it's dark and cold and I, my alarm is going off. I just want to sleep. Or it might look like, you know, I could leave work early and kind of short change this job, or I could stay for an extra 15 minutes and finish what I started and give my best. Or it could look like, Hey, it would be really inconvenient to go be there for this friend in their time of need. I'll just stay home and watch Netflix. Instead of doing that, you can get up, drive, go see that person and be there for them. Right. It could, it could look like anything. But I think the point too is like, you can talk about these things, like these big external things can be celebrated, right? You get a medal, you cross a finish line, whatever it is. Um, but like, there's so many small moments throughout every single day where we have the chance to make those tough decisions and to be proud of them, right? And I know it's something that I'm not good at um, being proud of myself. It's not something I think about for the big things, let alone the small things. But one practice I'm trying to implement is at the end of every day, just thinking back, be like, man, what did I do well? What am I proud of? Like that small decision that nobody will ever know about. It could be the tiniest thing, but I handled it like I wanted to handle it. Like, let me give myself a pat on the back and do that more. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Man, 1000%. Um, and I believe that when you start to cut those corners, even if people don't know it, you know it inherently. So when you're looking back in the mirror, you're you're like kind of like fracturing that trust with yourself, man. And so I think it's important to look back. That's a great thing. Like, what am I proud of today? Because I, I do a little like daily recap where I'll do, write the things that I learned, write the things that went well and write the things that I could improve upon. But what is something I'm proud of? Like, that's that's a great question to add into there and just reflect back. So because again, like the more you pay attention to it, the more it's going to happen. Cause you're like, all right, when I do, when, if, when I get through this, 
I can look back at the end of the day and be proud of myself. Yeah. It goes back to what you were saying on your on that one post on like, no matter what, you'll be tired at the end of the day. So are you going to be proud or are you not? Yeah. And I'd much rather be tired and proud than tired and upset. Yeah, um, exactly. So with all that being said, this is the Project Endure podcast. And I'm curious when you hear the word endure or endurance, what does that mean to you? Endurance to me, I think it's like similar to what I said. It's just that ability to handle that suffering, like the the ability to continue to push through hard things. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think of it as like a li uh, unlimited possibility mm. because like it's 2024. So like, uh, you know, about four and a half years ago, I couldn't run a mile. And this year I've done like nine ultra marathons. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like it, to me, like it's, it's incredible. Like how much potential there actually is when you embody that endurance because you know it's going to be hard, you know you're going to suffer, but it's continuing to push. And yeah, that's what it means to me, man. I think just like that ability, the ability to embrace suffering and push through. So I'll ask this question because I, I do a lot of thinking. This is for anybody listening an insight into how my mind works, the mind of Joe. Um, but like, I think words don't always do it justice. They, it, words are imperfect, right? Like we use words for certain things to try to convey this message that is these electrical signals in our brain, right? It's just wild to think about how that works. But, uh, my point is I think words have limitations. And so I'm wondering for you, when you say suffering, how, if at all is suffering different than struggling, um, or are those the same things? And, uh, we'll start there. I have a follow-up too. That's a great question, man. I'm just thinking like suffering versus struggling. Um, I feel like they're one and the same. I feel like one may be a little bit more extreme. Like if I, like, I feel like, you know, there's like struggle and then there's like another level, which is suffering. But I feel like they're one and the same in regard to just embracing a hard thing and moving through it. Um, I definitely feel like the word because that's a great point as well like words are just trying to like formulate or explain the chemical signals in our brain like when i think of like the new jersey devil 100 i'm like oh dude i suffered through that um but when i think of other things like yeah it was a struggle but they are similar in that same way you know what i mean so one and the same but i would just say to me at least like suffering just holds a little more weight in regard to like emotionally charging and um just like a little bit of a different level than struggle yeah. Yeah. And I would agree with that. And I think part of the reason I'm saying this is because I just read a book or part of a book that talked about, um, talks about life in a way that I, I hadn't thought about it beforehand. And I'll summarize this book without saying the title, uh, mostly because I can't pronounce the title and that's a bit embarrassing, but, um, uh, one of my clients had given it to me to read and in this book, this guy is looking for just enlightenment. He wants to be enlightened. And so he goes and he, you know, studies with the monks and he realizes he's kind of like missing something. It's not everything that he wanted it to be. And then he goes and finds someone who has a lot of material possessions and he lacks the spiritual component. And he, he goes to all these different people and tries these different things and he just can't figure it out. And uh, then he just sits by a river and he comes across this, I believe it's a fisherman. And he has this conversation and the fisherman tells him that life is a lot like a river and that all things kind of flow together and it's all intertwined. And he goes on and on and on. And he talks about how we can't explain things with words because words are exactly that. They're imperfect. We're trying to convey these things that really we can only feel. And I think a lot of what we're talking about, they're things you feel, right? And for someone listening, whether it's struggle or suffer to you, you know, when you're at that moment where you're doing something hard or you're handling something hard and you're torn between, do I give in and crawl into comfort or do I continue to push? And it's that feeling that I think you want to be in tune with. And it's that feeling that we're talking about. And so, yeah, just a, a bit of a tangent, but something that's important. Cause I think a lot of times in life we can think things, but we also need to feel things. Mm -hmm. It's important for people to experience, experience it because 
I feel like a lot of people will say to me personally, like, you know, they'll crack jokes like, I don't even drive that far or this, that, and the third. And it's like, if you just experience what it's like to push yourself to your point earlier beyond that point of when you want to quit, but you don't and you continue to push, just like you're saying, like that, that feeling is, I can't explain it. And it's the same reason why I'm continued to be drawn to these races. I mean, at the end, of, I did Wildwood 100 back in November of last year. And after that, I was like, I'm not racing ever again. I was like, this is silly. I'm like miserable during it. But then afterwards, I'm like, when's the next one? And it's people think I'm nuts. But it's like once you have that feeling, once you experience that, it's like, I don't know, again, like that, that, that cookie in the cookie jar. Like, I just always, always encourage people like, just take the step, even if you don't believe in yourself, like I believe in you. So take that and just go take action on it. So you can feel what I'm saying, you know? So, and this is another piece and maybe we dive into this in a whole separate conversation, but you know, you and I are in similar lines of work, right? And like part of our job is to help people believe in themselves, but part of that sometimes happens with us believing in someone before they believe in themselves. And there's so much power in that borrowed belief because it might be just enough to get someone to do that thing or to push just that, that extra little bit to learn a little bit more about themselves, to realize that they can do it. And I feel like we all need those people in our lives, you know, whether it's a friend or a mentor or a coach or whatever, we need those people who see a little bit more in us and then challenge us and support us to bring it out. Um, because that's, that's really how you grow. And so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Cause it's, it's what you do. 1000% man. And that's why, I, I mean, I'm, I know it's the same with you and project Endure. It's like, I want to build what, what I think about is like, when I, you know, dropped out of school and I started doing 75 hard and like cleaning my diet up and everything along those lines, like I was lonely at that time, man. Like uh, I stopped hanging out with the people I used to hang out with because they would go to bars and stuff like that. And I didn't want to be in that environment. And so I think about like, what did I need at that time when I was itching for a change, but didn't know what to do. And that's what I try to cultivate so that people come in and, Hey, you know, I'm 25. I run these races, you know, so on and so forth. Somebody who is in their 50s may not resonate with me. I still have clients that that do and that are, but maybe they resonate with somebody else in the community and can vibe with them and hold each other accountable and things along those lines. So surrounding yourself with individuals that like expose you to that, because just like you said, sometimes you don't even believe in yourself. You may need to rely on the belief of other people like, all right, well, like they see something to me that I may not see in myself, but... I at least one, well, you owe it to yourself, but two, like, let's see, let's find out like, what's the worst thing that can happen. And I think when you're around people like that and can rely on people like that, you kind of like get a direction and can help you cut the learning curve. So you can get to that level sooner than I got to this level, you know? Yeah. There's a, uh, there's this great quote from uh, CS Lewis. And he says, when the whole world is running toward a cliff, he who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. And I think mm -hmm. that's what it is, right? Like you're, you live your life, you're around this group of people, you go out, you drink, you party, you do whatever. And then all of a sudden one day you start 75 hard and you're like, yeah, guys, I'm not going to go out this weekend. Right. And that group of people is like, dude, he's lost his mind. Like what mm -hmm. in the world? But you are right. What's going on? Yeah. Yeah. But you know, deep down that that's in alignment for what you want out of your life. And it takes so much courage to stick with that. And again, one of the reasons why it's important to have those people to look up to, to be around, to conversate with, to do hard things with, because yes, like it might seem crazy to certain groups of people, but to other groups of people like you and me, that's, that's the norm. That's what we do. Right. That's cool. And, um, you know, you're never alone. You just have to find the right group of people to, to be a little bit crazy with, I think is the point. 1000%. Absolutely. And, and that's literally, I, I'm big on like the in-person connection as well. Like there is nothing better, or I am not the guys that I ran to Wildwood with, like, we are so close. We could not talk for a couple days or a couple months, whatever it is. And hit it off. Like we, we were, we just saw each other yesterday. Like the connection there is so deep. So I love being around 
those types of people. And if there's, if it's local run clubs, like if it's communities like Project Endure, like Grit and Gratitude, like find your people, find your tribe and the people that you want to be with. And sometimes like, I mean, nothing changes, nothing, if nothing changes, like if you, if you can't change the people around you, change the people around you. Meaning if you can't influence those people to come do what you're doing, you're going to have to change who those people are that you are surrounding yourself with and not any hate to anybody that wants to stay the way they are. But I just want to be over here. I want to do something different. So therefore I want to be around people that are like that, you know? That's so good. If you can't change the people around you, change the people around you. I love that. Um, so with with all of that being said, and you know, my notes are incredibly long, which means the description of this podcast is going to be like the biggest paragraph anybody's ever seen. Um, we we've covered a lot of great stuff. And this final question of the podcast is important to me because there are people listening who, you know, they're in that dark spot. They're in in the middle of suffering, in the middle of the storm, and they don't have the people around them yet. They don't know how to get out of it. They're not even sure which way is up, but they're listening to our voices for whatever reason. And you get a chance to say whatever it is you want to that person who just doesn't know where to go or what to do. Uh, what would you say to that person? I love this question. Um, first thing is just breathe. Because one thing that I realized for myself is when I find myself getting overwhelmed or stressed about anything, my breath is what goes first. Then my heart rate starts to get up. Then I start to spiral. And so just breathe. And it's connected to the second thing where it's what can you control? Because you can control your breath. But what else can you control? Throughout the race over the weekend, there was this guy who was doing it 12 hours. And he was he came in first place. He did 79 miles. And I, he flew past me. I'm like, Sean, how you feeling, man? He's like, all I can control is my heart rate and my mental state. And I was like, I really like that. I was like, I'm going to remind myself that this whole entire race. Thank you for that. And it's just to that point of control what you can. That's what 75 Heart did for me. When I was in that hole, like, I want to be completely transparent. Again, when I at this point in time, I couldn't run a mile. I just dropped out of college when everybody around me told me don't do it and that they weren't supporting my decision. And it seemed like my life was falling apart. At least I was like, um, I, I was petrified. I was terrified. And all I did was just control what I could and everything started to get better. And that's the food that I'm eating, the thoughts that I'm thinking. I realize now that all, not all thoughts are my thoughts. And sometimes I let control, let go control a little bit. And uh, sometimes I need to reel it back in. Meditation has helped that out a lot for me. Um, what am I listening to? Like, it's crazy that as I went on this journey, I stopped listening to the old like rap music that I used to listen to. And now it's more like upbeat and positive music. Like focus on what you can control and just breathe. Those are the two most important things. And if you focus on what you can control, you'll get a, li a list of tasks that you can do. Cause I used to just shell up and go lay down in bed, but now it's like, yo, I have this list. All right, I'm going to focus on this list. I'm just going to do this because this is what's in my control. Mm -hmm. And the rest take care of itself. Yeah, uh, that's so good. And, you know, there aren't many podcasts that I listen back to uh, because I had the conversation and I was there. And, you know, I think listening back to your own voice is kind of weird. Um, doesn't doesn't sound quite like you to yourself, but uh, th this is one that I will be listening back to and in, uh, in large part because of, you know, all the wisdom that you shared. And I'm so grateful for that. Aunt. And for people who are grateful for that and want to reach out and thank you or connect with you or follow along with your journey, where's the best place for people to do that? Um, so I'm most active on Instagram, um, and underscore D'Andrea is my tag. Um, if you search the grit and gratitude community on Facebook, as soon as somebody requests to join as a free community, I send them a invite, a friend invite right away and send them a welcome video to connect with them. So those are the two main, two main spots, but right back at you, Joe, like as you're sitting there, like you're, you know, dropping those fire quotes and, um, dropping some wisdom. I was thinking to myself, I was like, I'm going to need to think back or listen back so I can take some notes because this was great, man. Thank you. Oh man. Of course it's uh it's an honor on my end. And, uh, as we wrap up, I will be at the Philadelphia marathon. I know you're running, correct. Yep. Um, 
And so I don't know where I'll be standing yet, but I will have confetti cannons. And so, you know, on air, on record, do I have permission to shoot a confetti cannon at you at the race? I would love it. Awesome. Cool. Well, you can look forward to that. I'll look forward to seeing you. And thank you again for everything that you do. I appreciate you, man. Thank you, Joe. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor Podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice, and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you, and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing. If you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.